I'm going to critique some of your guys' favorite pastors today, so I'm sure the comments section will be very calm and respectful. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. So today I'm going to go mining because I recently lost all my stuff after I died while I talk about seven famous pastors. I'm going to be going to the Baptist town of Repentin on this Minecraft server because five of the seven pastors I'm talking about are Baptists. So the pastors I'm going to be giving my thoughts on today are John Piper, Vody Bauckham, James White, Paul Washer, Todd Friel, Doug Wilson, and Bishop Robert Barron. So that's five Baptists, one Presbyterian, and one Catholic. Now, I'm Presbyterian, but I'm not going to be judging them based on denominational differences. Now, none of these reviews are going to be entirely positive or negative. I'm just going to try and give some thoughts. I'm not saying, I'm not ranking them, not making any sort of tier list or anything like that. And I talked about other pastors like John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul and Tim Keller in my previous video called My Thoughts on Various Famous Pastors. But then people started asking me for my opinions on some of these other guys. So I'm going to make a video. That's why I'm making this video. So why are there so many Baptists on this list, especially because I'm not Baptist? Well, I am Reformed because I'm Presbyterian. And in the Reformed world, even though I don't think Reformed Baptists can really be considered truly Reformed, most of the famous pastors that are considered Reformed are actually Baptist, not Presbyterian. And the reason for that is simply because there's more of a culture of celebrity pastors in Baptist churches than in Presbyterian churches. Like, we Presbyterians try to see our pastors as more interchangeable so that we don't idolize any pastor. And that's why the beliefs of the Presbyterian Church are not the beliefs of any one pastor. It's just the beliefs of our confessions. So that's why it's like, it doesn't really matter which pastor is preaching at your church. The theology of the church doesn't change when the pastor changes because the theology of the church is always just um, either the Westminster Confession or whatever confession your church uses. But um, because Baptists don't always use confessions, I mean, sometimes they do, especially some Reformed Baptists use the 1689 London Baptist Confession. But because they don't do that, um, they're often just Congregationalist where the pastor basically does define the theology of the church. And because of that, that forms a bit of a culture of celebrity pastors. Like, John MacArthur basically started a whole new school of, of theology, and that's why there's entire churches whose theology is basically just John MacArthur. Anyway, I'm not talking about MacArthur this time. I have a, I have a different video for that. And as you guys know, I'm not the biggest fan, but I explain why in that other video. So I'm going to be talking about five Baptist pastors, all of whom are considered Reformed because they hold to what's called the Five Points of Calvinism. But the Five Points of Calvinism really only describe the Calvinist view on predestination and not the Calvinist view on other things like the sacraments. And the main reason I don't consider Reformed Baptists truly Reformed is because they don't hold to a Reformed view of the sacraments. But because so many of the quote-unquote Reformed celebrity pastors are Baptist, a lot of people don't even know what the Reformed view of the sacraments is. Baptists generally see the sacraments as symbolic. Maybe some of them see it as a bit more of a symbol, especially some of the Baptists who hold to the 1689 London Baptist Confession. But generally speaking, Baptists don't think the sacraments actually save us in any sense. And Presbyterians do. And some Presbyterians don't even know this. But if you read the Westminster Confession of Faith, it says the sacraments are effectual means of salvation. Now, it's different than, than like the Lutheran or Catholic view of this, because we think the sacraments only save the elect, whereas Lutherans and Catholics think they save everyone, but you can like lose that salvation. But we still think the sacraments save, and Baptists don't. So that's why, generally speaking, I don't consider Reformed Baptists truly Reformed. But the most Reformed Baptist, and also my favorite Baptist, I would say is Vody Bauckham. So he's the first one I'm going to review. So Vody Bauckham is, I think, a really good pastor. He is my favorite Baptist. He has such a great great way of speaking and stuff. And he has advocated for a higher view of the sacraments in the Baptist church. He has advocated for a weekly communion. And uh, he has almost like shocked Todd Friel, who is another Baptist pastor when he said that. And I guess I'll, I'll talk about Todd Friel next. But yeah, Vody Bauckham does have a more sacramental view than most. Vody Bauckham does hold to the 1689 London Baptist Confession 
and does quote it a lot. Now, the 1689 Lemon Baptist Confession, it's still not what I would consider truly reformed. It's not quite there, but it's a lot closer to being reformed than a lot of other Baptists like Todd Friel or John Piper, who still agree with some aspects of Calvinism, but not good enough. So, Vody Bauckham, he is a confessional Baptist. That's important. And he also has a way of communicating ideas that a lot of other people forget about. Like, he's also talked about why we need to build beautiful things, and that's another thing Baptists have often forgotten about. And his way of articulating the gospel, like, he's not afraid of offending anyone. And while I may criticize, like, conservative Baptists for a lot of things, um, I do not criticize their unwillingness I do not criticize their willingness to offend people in what they say, because our culture is obsessed with making sure people aren't offended. But, you know, the gospel is offensive to some people. So the best example of this, my favorite example from Vody Bauckham, is uh, he starts this whole... I don't, I don't know if this was even a sermon or a talk or a lecture, but he starts out by saying, What is wrong with the world? You. And I've made posts about that comparing... Vody Bauckham saying that to like a Joel Osteen sermon where Joel Osteen's like, you are powerful enough, you are good enough, you have everything it takes to achieve your destiny. And it's to compare that with Vody Bauckham actually preaching the message of the Bible, which is that you are wretched, you are dead in sin, and you have rebelled against God. And that's offensive to people. Like, preachers like Joel Osteen, and I'm not actually reviewing Joel Osteen in this video, but preachers like Joel Osteen, who I don't consider to be a legitimate pastor at all, um, that's why he's not in this video. Like, most of those megachurch pastors, I'm not even worth reviewing because they're not legitimate in any way. Um, but those megachurch celebrities, I guess you could call them, it's just all about making people feel good. And it's not about preaching the message of the Bible at all. It's, it's just about telling people exactly what they want to hear, and that's what con men have done for, for all of history. Like, I have unreligious, non-religious relatives that still enjoy listening to Joel Osteen because... Um, his messages are so unoffensive that you don't even need to be Christian to basically agree with them. In some cases. Now, I have heard that sometimes Joel Osteen says more orthodox things, but they don't actually get publicized. But this video is not about uh, Joel Osteen. It's about the, those seven guys I mentioned earlier. So yeah, Vody Bauckham, not afraid to offend people, and does collect, uh, correct some common errors in the Baptist Church. And another thing I really like about Vody Balkum is he has good eschatology. He is amillennial, and that's important because a lot of Baptists are premillennial. I think amillennial is simply the biblical eschatology because the Bible makes it pretty clear that the second coming, the final judgment, the final resurrection are all the same event. And premillennialism tends to split it up into like two events, and if you're a dispensationalist, it splits it up into like three events, and there's like a seven-year gap between this and a thousand-year between gap between this multiplying entities uh, too much. And one of my favorite Vody Balkum quotes in support of amillennialism is that if you think the world is, is a sinking ship, like the premillennialists often do, if you think it's a sinking ship, there's no reason for Christians to improve the world like Jesus told us to. As Vody Balkum says, one of my favorite quotes, why rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic? So yeah, that's Vody Balkum. I'm, I'm a fan of him. There is one issue with him, and it's not just because he's Baptist, because I'm taking into account the denominational differences here. My one issue with him is he has indeed promoted the subordinationist heresy. The subordinationist heresy says that um, the person of the Son, of God the Son, eternally submits to God the Father. Now, the Bible does say Jesus submits to the Father, but the Bible also speaks of Jesus doing things that we know God doesn't do, like getting hungry and getting thirsty. Um, so when the Bible speaks of Jesus submitting to the Father, that's only according to his human nature. So Jesus' human will submits to the Father, but his divine will cannot submit to the Father because his divine will is the same as the Father's divine will. There's one divine will. Will comes with nature, not with, with person. But... Um, People who are subordinationist, people who believe the Son eternally submits to the Father, not just in his incarnation, but eternally, they sort of promote a kind of um, social Trinitarianism, which is the idea that God has three wills, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit each have their own will. But I don't think that's biblical, because 
for God to be God, God cannot submit to anyone. So if the Son is really God, then the Son can't submit to, to anyone. We do believe the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, but that's not the same as a submission of will. Um, that's just defining who the person of the Son is in relation to the Father. Anyway, so yeah, that's that's the only problem I can think of with Vodibalkum, is subordinationism. But other than that, he is excellent. And when I said it's a heresy, yeah, it is a heresy, but it, it's one of those minor heresies where it's not like a damning heresy, it's just the logical conclusions of it might be. Now, next up is Todd Friel. Like I said, when Vody Bauckham said we should do weekly communion, Todd Friel, I saw, was kind of taken aback. So Todd Friel runs Wretched Radio, which is a, in quotes, reformed podcast, more like in just the, the John MacArthur flavor of reformed, that, that type of camp. And, like, Todd Friel, he's a smart guy. He's also a really funny guy. He does a lot of good skits, and he gets across a lot of good messages. But my issue with him, really, is he makes it sound like biblical Christianity does not exist outside of, like, conservative Baptist evangelical circles. Like, um, one time he actually did a review of one of my videos. Um, it wasn't on, like, YouTube. It was just on his personal, like, audio podcast. But I made this one video about different denominations, like, all Christian denominations explained in 12 minutes. And he did, he did a review of that. And in that review, he said that any Christian who believes baptism saves falls outside the bounds of lowercase o orthodoxy. And if he really believes that, he's literally saying none of the reformers are orthodox. And lowercase o orthodoxy doesn't mean Eastern Orthodox, it just means, like, beliefs that are true Christianity. So if he really believes you can't be a true Christian and believe that baptism saves, he doesn't think any of the reformers are true Christians. Now. I would just give him the benefit of the doubt and assume that he's just he just doesn't know what the reformers believe about baptism because a lot of Baptists kind of assume that aside from infant baptism itself, the reformers basically believed what they believe. Or the Baptists might claim that maybe the reformers had a high view of the sacraments, but that was maybe just leftover stuff from Roman Catholicism they forgot to discard. But no, all the reformers, including John Calvin by the way, believed that baptism saves in some sense. Now they didn't, like I said, they didn't believe the in the Catholic version of baptismal regeneration because they didn't believe baptism could save you apart from faith. And they, as well as the Catholics, believe that there can be exceptions to that. So like whenever someone's like, oh, what about the thief on the cross? The thief on the cross wasn't baptized. Well, we shouldn't get our theology of baptism from the passage about the thief on the cross. We should get our theology of baptism from the Bible verses that actually speak about baptism. Um, and one of them says, baptism saves. 1 Peter 3.21. And almost every Bible verse that talks about baptism attributes some saving power to it. And I know the Baptists will try and like explain this away. And it's not like they don't have explanations for those verses. They do. So I know that if you're... If you're a Baptist, you might be commenting right now, like, how you interpret those verses. And I get it. There are Baptist interpretations. I just think it's it's a bit of mental gymnastics. I think the reason they deny that baptism saves is because they're worried it contradicts salvation by faith alone. Not out of a, just a faithful biblical exegesis. But they don't need to worry about that because all of the Reformers believed in salvation by faith alone and all of the Reformers believed baptism saves. But what Todd Friel said in his review of my video... Um, is that if you um, believe that, you're outside of lowercase o orthodoxy. And in my video, I even said, like, Lutherans believe baptism saves. And obviously, Todd Friel didn't want to damn all Lutherans, because Lutherans are, are Protestants, descended from Martin Luther. So he said something kind of strange to get around that. When I said, Lutherans believe baptism saves, Todd Friel, Todd Friel was like, well, some Lutherans believe that baptism saves, but some uh, do not. And I was like, what Lutherans have you talked to? Every single Lutheran theologian or pastor I've ever talked to ever has said baptism saves and will not shut up about that. And I know that conversations with individuals of a denomination aren't always the most edifying. So just read the Lutheran Confessions, read the Augsburg Confession, read the Book of Concord. It could not be clearer that baptism saves. I just think a lot of um, Baptists like Todd Friel can't wrap their heads around the fact that the Protestant beliefs, the Protestant doctrine of salvation by faith alone, can be compatible with a high view of the sacraments. 
And that's why they're they're almost in denial of it. And that's why my main criticism of Todd Friel is he makes it sound like biblical Christianity does not exist outside of those either conservative Baptist circles or Baptist adjacent things, like the more Baptist leaning wings of the, the Presbyterian church. Like like Ligonier Ministries, a lot of those Ligonier pastors are Presbyterian, but they're what I would call more Baptist leaning Presbyterians because they generally have a lower view of the sacraments than the original Presbyterians did. All right, next up is John Piper. He's another another one of these um, Calvinistic Baptists. I think Calvinistic is a better word than Reformed because I don't consider Reformed Baptists truly Reformed, but you can say they're Calvinistic because they do agree with the Calvinistic doctrine of predestination. Maybe not Calvinist, but Calvinistic. There, there's, a, there's a difference there. Um, just the way I would say Presbyterians who lean more Baptist aren't Baptist, but they're Baptistic, especially in their view of the sacraments. All right, so John Piper, what do I like about him? So he is maybe my second favorite Baptist, just behind Bodie Bauckham, and I haven't read that much of his stuff, but I have started reading his book, Desiring God, and I think it's a good book. I agree with the general premise of it that we should glorify God by enjoying him. It's like our reason for worshiping God fundamentally is so that we can enjoy him for our own enjoyment. And he calls this view Christian hedonism, which on the outset sounds kind of disturbing. It's like, we know hedonism is bad, but what he means by that is hedonism in the sense of you're worshiping God because of the true joy and pleasure that it gives you. And I know that sort of language can make people uncomfortable, but he makes a good case for it. And like, and he does actually quote the Westminster Confession, the which is the Presbyterian Confession. So I kind of like that. In the very beginning of his book, he quotes the, not the Confession, sorry, the Catechism, the Westminster Catechism, um, which says, man's chief end is to glorify God and, and enjoy him forever. And John Piper says, uh, we can sort of extrapolate from that, that man should glorify God by enjoying him forever. It glorifies God when we enjoy him. And that should be one of our, if not the chief motivation for worshiping God. And that makes a lot of sense. The only issue with talking that way is it can drift into a type of lordship salvation. And I'll, I'll talk more about that when I get into Paul Washer. Now, the lordship salvation controversy is more of a controversy in like the Baptist churches, so I don't really take a side on that one way or the other. But there is a type of preaching that can cause people to needlessly doubt their own salvation. Because if you say that you need to have, it, that if you need to feel like you're desiring God all the time, because that was the title of John Piper's book, it's called Desiring God. If you keep telling people that they need to be desiring God if they have a true faith, then it's going to cause people anxiety if maybe they don't desire God all the time. Because people are sinners and they often desire sins. And preaching like that can sometimes make it sound like if you don't hate your sin enough, maybe you're not saved. And John Piper's book sometimes can hint in that direction, and it can cause people to look too much to themselves and their own good works, and more like their own avoidance of sin for assurance of salvation. And um, I know this is a bit of a crude topic, but it needs to be addressed. So many people, especially young men, usually young men, come to me and say, like, Redeem Zoomer, I don't think I'm saved because I can't stop sinning. And what I always text them is, aside from pornography, are there any sins you can't stop? And they're like, oh wait, then never mind, then I'm good. So yeah, some people are addicted to sin. Sin is an addiction. It doesn't mean you're not saved if you're addicted to a certain sin, even if that sin is a very bad one, like pornography. And it is a very bad sin. It's bad for you, it's bad for the people involved, it's bad for everyone. But it doesn't mean you're not saved, because as Paul says in Romans 7, the Christian life is always a battle. It's like if you do struggle with sin, that is a good sign, because it shows that there is a, a, a redeemed part of you that is struggling against that sin. If you don't struggle with sin, that's more concerning. If you don't struggle with your sin, if there is no struggle at all, that's what you should be worried about. So I guess the way I would put it is, if you're worried about your salvation, don't be. If you're not worried about your salvation, maybe you should be.
All right, so that leads me to the next person I'm going to talk about, who is Paul Washer. Now, John Piper's book and John Piper's rhetoric sometimes has that sort of lordship salvation feel. I go a lot more in depth. I have an older video called The Problem with Lordship Salvation. But the most notorious example of this, this type of preaching, this type of preaching that says um, you need to look to your own good works and your own personal affections and desires to know if you're saved, is, of course, Paul Washer. Now, I'm not saying Paul Washer is a bad preacher in every way. Paul Washer does preach a lot of great things. All of these pastors I'm talking about preach the gospel, and that is more important than anything. But even, even if Paul Washer preaches the gospel, he doesn't seem to have a very good law gospel distinction. What is the law gospel distinction? It's something that the classical Protestant reformers, like especially Martin Luther more than anyone else believed in, it's that the law and the gospel are both messages the Bible gives us, but they need to be separate. They need to be well, not separate. They need to be distinct. It's a law gospel distinction, not a law gospel separation. I shouldn't have said separate, but they need to be distinct. The law says, here's what you need to do to be saved. And the gospel says, here's what Jesus has done for you. The law says do, and the gospel says done. So the reason they need to be kept distinct is so that the go you don't add works to the gospel. That's what, that's what Martin Luther was so concerned about. Now, Paul Washer believes in salvation by faith alone. He believes that there's nothing we can do to be saved. But because Paul Washer's preaching is very centered around, like, having good morals and um, personally hating your own sin, which is good. We should all be told to hate sin. The Bible tells us to hate our sin. But because that's such a focus of his preaching, a lot of times it causes people to look to their own actions to know if their faith is genuine. Because... People like Paul Washer will say, yes, salvation is by faith alone, but if your faith doesn't inspire you to stop sinning, or at least if he, he'll say that you don't need sinless perfection, but if your faith doesn't inspire you to continually hate sin more and more and commit sin less and less, maybe it's not a true faith. And that's the problem. Now, sanctification isn't always a, a linear process. People often backslide. That doesn't mean they're not saved. But I think the deeper issue is that it causes people to focus too much on their own thoughts, too much on their own feelings, and that is when the devil can try and accuse us. Martin Luther had so many arguments with the devil, and um, in his arguments, the devil would keep trying to convince him that because of his own sins, he can't be saved. And a lot of people who have actually had a traumatic background, Paul Washer's preaching can be especially damaging to. And I know this is not what he intends. I know that he does not intend to make people look to their own works. I know that's not his intention, but that's what happens. Um, so I'm not saying that he denies the gospel. I'm not saying that he's trying to conflate law and gospel. I know why he says what he says, because I'm, I'm assuming he's from the South because of his really thick Southern accent. And... You know, I didn't grow up in the South, but I go to college in the South, and there are a lot of nominal cultural Christians who think they're Christian because they're a good American who goes to Chick-fil-A or something. I don't know. And they're, like, especially in, in college, there's a ton of people who say they're Christians, and they do the most, like, degenerate things, especially in the fraternities and the sororities. But what Paul Washer is famous for is saying, like, speaking to a bunch of Christian youth, and he's like, a lot of people in this room, a hundred years from now, will most likely be in hell. And he, um, then he gives this passionate speech on, like, why um, we need to actually care about our faith. And it's a good speech. He talks about how, like, um, a bunch of children overseas in, like, Peru, where he's done ministry, care about their faith so much more than American Christians. And then the audience applauds, and then he says his famous line. He's like, I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. And it's like, yeah, it's it's a nice zinger line. And given that particular audience, probably about a bunch, a bunch of college-age kids, probably a bunch of people who were only cultural Christians, it makes sense why he said what he said. But his teachings are not only received by frat boys. A lot of people who are in much different circumstances receive his teachings, and it's detrimental to them. I, for very many months, on my own page, 
I received messages from a girl who had been severely abused in her childhood. And I kept telling this girl, you shouldn't be coming to me. You need to go to church. But it took a while to actually get her going to church. Once she started going to church, she didn't need me, which is good because I'm not a pastor and I shouldn't be used as one. You guys should not use me as, as your pastor, by the way, because I'm not a pastor. I have zero credentials. I am only meant to be a gateway. I am only meant to be a gateway drug to actual theology. I am only meant to point people in the right direction. That is my only vocation as of now. But this girl kept give, telling me endless anxieties about her, her salvation because of these sinful thoughts she couldn't get out of her mind. And I'm no psychologist. I don't even really believe in psychology. That's a topic for another video. But I could tell that these sinful thoughts she was having was really just a product of her abuse from, from childhood. But because she listened to so much Paul Washer, she kept thinking that her inability to rid herself of those sinful thoughts meant that she wasn't saved. And this applies to a lot of people. Anytime someone tells me that, like, anytime some young man, especially, um, in addition to the porn thing, anytime some young man says, I don't think I hate my sin enough, I don't think my faith is genuine, that's the real thing. Okay, when, when a young man says... Um, I can't get rid of sin, then I ask, okay, aside from porn, what sin can't you get rid of? And then they're like, oh wait, then never mind. And when someone, young man or young woman, or really anyone, tells me, I don't know if my faith is genuine, I always ask them, okay, how much Paul Washer have you been listening to? And they're always like, how did you know? I, I, I knew because I, I knew. Because he has caused a lot of people anxiety about that. That being said, I, I still think he is a smart guy. And one of my favorite quotes from him is, even though he is a Reformed Baptist, one of his quotes apparently is, he said, Presbyterians are just Reformed Baptists who can read. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's good. Particularly, uh, Presbyterians are Reformed Baptists who can read Acts 2, 38, 39, where um, Peter says the, be baptized and the promise is for you and your children, and baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. But, you know... Um, Baptists are very good um, at gymnastics, particularly mental gym. I'm, I'm kidding. Anyway, so now we're on to our last Baptist for the day, and this is James White. So James White is famous for his debates. He debates Catholics. He debates Muslims. He's especially good at debating Muslims. He debates atheists, particularly Bart Ehrman, who I think Bart Ehrman is the most formidable atheist opponent because there's a lot of atheists who critique Christianity, and you can tell they don't understand Christianity at all. But Bart Ehrman definitely does understand Christianity, at least. You can understand Christianity and still not believe it. Bart Ehrman is, is personally an apostate, but like he was a, a devout Christian and then abandoned it. And even though I'm Reformed, I believe that you can have a temporary faith and walk away from the faith. But Bart Ehrman is one of the smartest atheists, and James White has done a great job debating him. He also debates a lot of Muslim apologists and does a very good job doing so. And he's debated some Catholics. I think when James, de James White debates Catholics, the Catholics usually win. But when James White debates non-Christians, James White almost always wins. I just think that... You know, to really debate a Catholic as a non-Catholic, you need a robust understanding of church history. But James White, as a result of being Baptist, doesn't have the best grasp on church history. But James White still has a very good understanding of church history for a Baptist. And I'm not trying to completely dis Baptists here. I'm just saying that's sort of programmed into the Baptist system. Part of the Baptist system is moving away from a focus on church history and more of a focus on studying the Bible without being influenced by church history, because Baptists always accuse the Reformers of, you know, trying to be biblical but still clinging to infant baptism because that was part of church history, even though the arguments for infant baptism that John Calvin makes have nothing to do with church history, it's just purely biblical. A lot of Reformed Baptists don't even know that John Calvin believed in infant baptism, they often assumed Calvin was maybe one of them. But no, Calvin actually said that, Calvin said that Satan doesn't want people to believe in infant baptism. So uh, take from that what you will. Anyway, but James White, he doesn't have the best understanding of church history because when James White still tries to talk about Reformed theology, I still think he misunderstands it. 
Um, especially James White has like a six part lecture series about the reformed view of the Lord's Supper. Now, the truly reformed view of the Lord's Supper, and by the way, this is why I don't consider reformed Baptist truly reformed. The truly reformed view of the Lord's Supper is that we really receive the body and blood of Christ. What that means is we spiritually receive it. So it's not the Catholic view of transubstantiation. We spiritually receive it. That means the Lord's Supper basically makes us more like Jesus. When the Bible says Christ lives in us, it's speaking literally. And uh, 1 Corinthians says that the bread we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So there's this big doctrine of union with Christ that's taught all throughout the New Testament. And the Lord's Supper is sort of the sacrament through which that happens. And the Reformed doctrine of the Lord's Supper tries to be as biblical as possible. So basically affirming that we really receive the body and blood of Christ. Because in John 6, Jesus does say, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have eternal life. But we don't believe in transubstantiation because we also believe that ever eh, we also believe that ever since the ascension, Jesus' body has been in heaven. So the Holy Spirit forms the bond between us and Christ because Christ is in heaven. And the reason that makes sense is because ever since Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has been the bridge between us and Christ since Christ is in heaven ever since the ascension. Anyway, that's the Reformed view of the Lord's Supper. But when I listened to James White's um, lectures on the Reformed view of the Lord's Supper, I was hoping, I was like, okay, let's see if this Reformed Baptist is truly Reformed. Let's see if he really believes the Reformed view of the Lord's Supper. And of those six lectures, and it was painful to listen to them because it was like nonstop six hours of basically 90% of the lectures were basically just him talking about how bad the Catholic view is, how bad transubstantiation is. It's like, okay, I get it. We don't believe in transubstantiation. I know. What do we believe, though? So at the very end, he sort of began to touch on what the reform view is, and he quoted from the London Baptist Confession where it says we receive the body and blood of Christ not carnally or corporeally. That means we don't receive it physically. But he didn't really expound on, on what that means other than that to say, like, he almost made it sound like it's still a symbol. He was like, yeah, we're not physically receiving the body and blood of Christ, but, and then I was hoping he would say something like, but we really receive it spiritually. But what he seemed to say instead is that like, but when we receive these symbols, we are reminded of blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, okay, he, he doesn't really get it. So James White, really good debater, still doesn't really understand the reform tradition or the or certain things about church history. That's why I think he tends to lose in, in debates against Catholics. I think if you want good resources against Catholicism from a Protestant perspective, uh, Jordan Cooper is really good. And another good source who actually is Baptist is Gavin Ortland. I always say anytime I, um, anytime I criticize Baptists, I always mention that Gavin Ortland is one of my favorite YouTubers. He's a Baptist pastor. I've done a conversation with him. And I like him more than any other Presbyterian YouTubers. So he's, this is my equivalent of saying like, no, it's okay. I have a black friend. So that is all the Baptists for today. Now I'm going to talk about Doug Wilson. And he's technically a Presbyterian. Now, some people would say that his denomination doesn't count as Presbyterian because it's, it's a new denomination. It's called the CREC. Um, the, what's it? The Connection or Convention or something of Reformed Evangelical Churches. And I can see why people, the, the origins of that denomination are, are a little sketchy. It's like it kind of just popped out of nowhere. It didn't descend from a previous thing. Like even the PCA, which I say kind of did split off from the mainline, still had roots in the, the mainstream Presbyterian church, but the CREC kind of popped out of nowhere. Now, there's a lot of things the CREC people believe that I really like, but I take credentials seriously, and credentials of some in the CREC can be a little bit shaky. So that's, that's one of the issues with, uh, not Doug Wilson personally necessarily, but just that whole general crowd. But yeah, I'm going to talk about Doug Wilson now. So at first he was famous for being part of the Federal Vision Movement, and that's how the whole CREC got started. Basically, the Federal Vision Movement was a response to a low view of the sacraments in the mainstream conservative reform denominations like the PCA, and I think that was completely justified because the PCA generally does have a very low view of the sacraments. And the Federal Visionists were right to point that out. 
I think the Federal Visionists went too far in the opposite direction, though. They started affirming things like Pado Communion, and as a result, all the mainstream reform denominations, the conservative ones, I should say, they all basically canceled Federal Vision, and then that forced the Federal Vision people to basically make their own new denomination, which is the CREC. And because I'm in the PCUSA, the mainline denomination, we were never rocked by the Federal Vision controversy because we're too busy debating whether God exists. <laughs> Seriously, the mainline has way bigger problems than things like Federal Vision. So I don't take a side, I'm not for or against Federal Vision. I think it added some very important things to the theological conversation. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I think the motivations behind it were good. So... That means one of the things I really appreciate about Doug Wilson is his high view of the sacraments. He always talks about the importance of the sacraments. Another thing, he talks about the importance of the kingdom of God. And Doug Wilson, in some, in some ways, seems like just a very conservative alternate universe version of N.T. Wright, who I'm, who I'm a big fan of. It's not like N.T. Wright is a liberal. He's just a lot more liberal than people like Doug Wilson. But N.T. Wright's whole message is about the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is about the transformation of this world, and the gospel is not simply about you going to heaven. It's about heaven coming down to earth and transforming this world. That's N.T. Wright's whole message. That's kingdom theology, and N.T. Wright's view is very, very popular in the PCUSA. Um, my pastor pr quotes N.T. Wright all the time, and my pastor has also quoted Peter Lightheart occasionally, um, and Peter Lightheart is one of those other Federal Vision guys. But lately, in recent years, Doug Wilson hasn't been famous for Federal Vision because he's been more famous for his teachings about the, the kingdom of God. And that's why I say he's sort of like a conservative alternate universe version of N.T. Wright, because lately his message has been about the transformation of society, but coming from a much more conservative perspective. So he's always talking about, like, post-millennialism. Now, post-millennialism, it's an eschatological view. It's not always incompatible with amillennialism, but basically the post-millennial view is this optimistic view of the future that the whole world is eventually going to be Christianized. And that means Christians need to take over the whole world, not just culturally, like I would say, but also politically. And that's why Doug Wilson supports this thing called theonomy, where the Bible should be used to make the laws of the land. And different theonomy people will disagree on what that means exactly for the Bible to be used to make, like, our government's laws. But yeah, nowadays, what Doug Wilson mainly talks about is basically the culture and how to transform the culture and push it in a more conservative Christian direction. Now, I think that is something we need to do. Um, transform the culture and push it in a more Christian direction. I've made a video in the past where I'm saying maybe the word conservative needs to retire for us, even if I do agree with basically what conservatives believe in. But conservative sounds like you're going back to the past, and historically speaking, going back to the past has never worked. I mean, you literally cannot go to the back to the past. I think uh, Christianity should basically try and become the new quote-unquote progressivism, but I'm not saying we should adopt progressive beliefs. I'm saying we should basically reclaim the, the term progressive and basically talk more about moving towards the future rather than going back to the past. But I agree with the whole general idea of conservatism, so you guys don't need to worry about that. I'm not some sort of liberal. Now, sometimes I think Doug Wilson goes a bit too far in some of the um, issues he talks about. And I think he focuses a little bit too much on the cultural issues rather than the, the theological issues. Now, I'm not saying he neglects theological issues. He, he certainly doesn't. I'm not saying there's anything necessarily inherently wrong with what he says about the cultural issues. I just say he's a bit more conservative than I am on some of those issues. Like, especially... Um, everyone is somewhere on the theological... Sorry, on the, on the cultural spectrum of what they think gender roles should be. Everyone is more feminist than someone, and everyone is more sexist than someone. So on the on the spectrum of conservative to progressive in terms of in gender roles, I would say Doug Wilson is maybe like a degree or two more conservative than I am. Um, he focuses a disproportionate amount on that. I think the things, the problems we're seeing with gender roles today are really downstream of theological issues. I think... Politics is downstream of culture, and culture is downstream of theology. 
So while it's important to address social issues, and I do uh, address social issues and cultural issues, I think they're downstream of theological issues. I think if we just fix the theological issues, the cultural issues are going to solve themselves. So yeah, um, my overall view of Doug Wilson, he says a lot of important things that needs to be said. And he is one of the most brilliant wordsmiths. The way he can express ideas and concepts is brilliant. He truly has a gift, and everyone admits that, even people who don't like him. I would just say uh, his method of doing things sometimes I feel like does not garner the most credibility in the eyes of the culture especially because you know he is talking about taking over the culture for Christ but he has more of a retreatist way to do so like he's basically trying to take over this rural small town in Idaho called Moscow um and I feel like some of the post-millennial guys, even though they believe we're eventually going to retake the world, even though they believe Christians are eventually going to retake the culture, they believe that because we know that's eventually going to happen, we can basically remove ourselves from the culture for now and then just wait 300 years, have a bunch of babies, and then we'll take over the culture. Whereas I'm a millennial. I believe in the transformation of culture. I believe Christians should try to retake the culture. But I don't think we have any certainty that that is definitely going to happen. So I don't think we can just retreat for now and hopefully retake the culture later. I think we need to be engaged in every aspect of culture all the time. And that means not retreating to the rural areas. Now, of course, if someone lives in a rural area, that's fine. But there's this rhetoric that the cities are polluted and need to retreat from the cities. Cities are where culture happens. So Tim Keller was absolutely right when he says we need gospel urbanization. So yeah, those are my thoughts about Doug Wilson. I have some mixed feelings, um, but overall, I, I would say he's. I would say he says a lot of important things that needs that need to be said. He, like there's a bit of a personality cult around him, so I would I would just be cautious of that. But yeah, I, I'd say he he adds an important element to the conversation, even if he's not always the best source of theology for for everything. All right, now I'm gonna talk about uh, a Catholic a Catholic priest a Catholic bishop named Bishop Robert Barron. So he is one of my favorite Catholics. I think he's probably the favorite Catholic of mine because of how much of a deep philosophical approach he has to things. Like, there are other Catholic priests, I'm not going to name them, a lot of just, you know, popular Catholic radio priests that really make Catholicism sound like the Protestant straw man of Catholicism, where it's just like, hey, pray this special prayer, and Mary is going to give you 10 years off purgatory for any every time that you say this prayer. Source, I made it up. That's what a lot of those popular Catholic radio people sound like. And Bishop Robert Barron, he never sounds like that. He always shows uses philosophy and church history to not just specifically argue for Catholicism, but specifically show why Christianity makes sense. And another reason I really like him is because he always addresses people of all sorts of different perspectives and has a very fair treatment of them. Like, he is what, what, what we would call a conservative Christian. Basically all Catholic priests, with a few exceptions like Father James Martin, are conservative in some sense, at least culturally speaking, because they oppose, like, gay marriage and abortion. But Bishop Robert Barron will still have, like, a friendly, charitable review of something that President Obama wrote, for example. And Bishop Robert Barron is also very respectful to Protestants. He has some very charitable uh, analyses of Martin Luther, and he often quotes Protestant theologians like Karl Barth. So he's very open-minded, and he doesn't really compromise on his Catholic convictions in order to do so. Now, some people think he's, like, liberal because he's a hopeful universalist, but a hopeful universalist isn't the same thing as a universalist. A universalist is someone who actively denies that anyone will be in hell forever, whereas a hopeful universalist is basically someone who does not insist doctrinally that some people will be in hell forever. A hopeful universalist is someone who says it's possible that eventually all people could be saved. But that's not the same as a universalist. 
All right, so that the hopeful universalism, while I still wouldn't be one myself, it doesn't deny any core Christian doctrine. And I personally know a PCA pastor who is also a hopeful universalist. So that that's not a very big problem. So yeah, Bishop Robert Barron, he is Catholic, so I don't agree with his his Catholic views, but he is extremely smart, extremely philosophical. Another thing I really like about him is he's very good at reconciling faith and science, which is something that Protestants need to start getting better at. So yeah, those are seven famous pastors who I um who I like. Who I like in some ways, maybe criticize in other ways, but ultimately they're all Christians. They're all advancing the kingdom of God in different ways, and we should all listen to them because they add important things to the conversation. So I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching.